And hello and welcome to the first webinar in a series of webinars discussing the importance of the foundational community support resource and how it can benefit in serving some of Washingtonians' most vulnerable members. Um, today's webinar is titled Adding Foundational Community Support to Your Organization's Book of Business. And we will discuss the FCS benefit and outline ways an interested organization can embed the FCS benefit into its day-to-day -day business practices in order to qualify and benefit from the new Medicaid resource. So welcome and thank you for being here. So who is joining us? We had this wonderful poll and I'm wondering if we should just skip this and if you all would like to put into the chat box feature who you are and what where you're representing today. If you are a service provider in the field or maybe you're a managed care organization or a housing developer, we would love to know who's participating today. So please use the chat function. We're gonna use this to communicate questions and um, any communication that you wanna to have to the presenters. Um, you can place here in the chat function. Make sure in the two that it's uh, defaulted to organizers and panelists um, as, as everyone so we can all see your questions. And please use that and let us know who's joining us today. So a little bit about CSH. We are a national nonprofit organization with offices and staff working throughout the entire continental United States to include staff uh, based in Seattle, Washington. Our focus is on supportive housing and housing solutions that improve the lives of vulnerable people by helping to maximize public resources to create more supportive housing solutions to make lasting permanent impact and that ultimately helps build strong, healthy communities. And that's what our core mission is at CSH. We have a robust training uh, center that we use to help communicate for basic training, one-on-one trainings on how to do basic services like financing, supportive housing, provide Medicaid services, and be able to embed supportive housing into your day-to-day -day practices. And so we have a robust training that uh, we would love to offer anyone that needs assistance from webinars and self-paced online courses to workshops. We can customize things to meet your, your business's needs. So that's an offer that we wanna make sure that you all are aware of that we provide at CSH. So some of the questions that we get very often is, will we receive the slides and the recordings from today? And we wanna let you know that that is uh, absolute. You will receive that. The Washington State um, has a wonderful um, website that you all will be receiving the links to this website, to this webinar, as well as the recordings, and it will be posted on the website for you all to access in the future. So a little bit about us today. This is your panel who will be joining, uh, and we have some experts that are here today, I'm talking now. My name is Brooke Page, and I am the Senior Program Manager from CSH. I work actually in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm part of the Western Region team. And I'm joined today by Dr. Marcella McGuire, who is our Health Systems Integration Director. And her background, she's based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and has a extensive background in the conversation for today around the Medicaid benefit as well as Debbie Thiel, uh, who is our Managing Director for the Western Region. She is based out of Seattle, Washington, and has been instrumental in the development of the Foundational Community Supports for Washington State. Um, so also joining us on the, the webinar today is Tisha Kirschbaum and Kate Baber with Washington State Healthcare Authority. They will be assisting us with answering questions and troubleshooting, as you saw earlier today, so we really appreciate their support today on this webinar. Um, just so you all are aware, this is a series, and this is the first of the series for this uh, information around foundational community supports. So today we're doing the adding the foundational community supports to your organization's book of business. On November 1st, we're going to be discussing learning from Los Angeles, where we will have expert panels from Los Angeles giving some historical context around some resources and financial resources that are really helping to push the envelope and move the needle around homelessness in Los Angeles. And then on November 15th, where um, Debbie will be back to discuss learning how to braid foundational community supports 
with other funding sources um, and, and how that can look in, in your financial book of business. So really hope that you all can join us moving forward for those additional discussions. And an overview of today, so we are going to be discussing uh, supportive housing and Medicaid and provide an introduction to what is foundational community supports and why is, should this be an important conversation for you and your organization, adding the benefit to your agency's book of business by addressing your service delivery, revenue, provider requirements, uh, and uh, discussing additional resources that you can use, and then answering any questions um, at the end. So we encourage you to use the chat function throughout if you have questions that you want to um, ask, and our uh, moderators from the state will be helping to cipher through those. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. McGuire to give us some um, information and discuss why, what, give a background on supportive housing and why it's important. Thank you so much, Brooke. I appreciate this. Um, and thank you to uh, Kate and the folks from the Washington Healthcare Authority as well. Um, Washington is really a national leader in this work. Um, the more and more I delve down into it in Washington, and I, I work with many, many states on this book of business, we see um, really how a leader what leadership Washington State is doing and how they're really trying to, to really push this together, move the needle and give everyone the support that they need, uh, providers, communities, et cetera, um, in order to make this happy. We're excited to talk about the exciting opportunity to talk about services um, and to talk about it in a way that meets the needs of the providers, the tenants and the communities um, in ways that few other funding sources do around the country. Um, we see that as communities are targeting supported housing more effectively to folks with greater needs, we see greater needs and greater services and really working within the Medicaid program is going to be the one place where you can find the supportive services that you need in order to address um, the needs of the folks that you're, that you're serving. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. So briefly, I wanna be sure we're all on the same page exactly about what supportive housing is. We're talking about a specific intervention that combines affordable housing with services that a subset of people need to access housing and remain stably housed. So pre-tenancy services, services that get people housed, um, and services that help keep people housed. Supportive housing is for people with significant needs and disabilities. We'll talk a little bit about the specifics of eligibility for the foundational community supports or the FCA. Um, as many of you know, because you do it every day, supportive housing requires what we refer to as a three-legged stool of financing, very challenging. Um, it's capital to build the buildings, operating and rental assistance to keep those rents affordable for people with extremely low incomes, and then services funding to support people to remain stably housed and provide them access, facilitate their access to other community services, including healthcare services as well as other social services. One of the biggest challenges in funding supportive housing has always been the lack of a reliable, dedicated source of services funding. And we at CSH believe that the FCS benefit is a game changer in this equation because Washington is now providing a robust benefit to serve the most vulnerable individuals with tenancy supports, the core services in supportive housing that help people get housed and stay housed. Next slide, please. So what's particularly great about the way the FCS benefit is structured is that it pays for core supportive housing services, what we refer to as tenancy support services, separately from and in addition to other healthcare services, such as substance abuse disorders and treatment, mental health services, childcare, employment services. It's really its own spoke in this wheel of supportive housing. Uh, today we're going to focus on the supportive housing aspects, but the other remarkable feature, what's really unique about how Washington is implementing FCS is that it also pays for supportive employment. We all know that's another critical service and support for people living in supportive housing. It also doesn't make any changes in how people access these benefits. So the additional benefits. So substance abuse services, mental health services, primary health care services, FQHC services, they're all still available in the community. Um, and your services can both assist people in remaining stably housed, as well as assisting and facilitating their access to these other services. Washington Health Care Authority has done an amazing job of making sure that all of these benefits are still in place. Tenancy support services is both focused on sustaining the tenancy and also making sure that people are connected in the right way to the community services that we know they need. 
So FCS pays for these services in addition to existing Medicaid-funded mental health services. It's really important because historically, what we used to talk about when using Medicaid in support of housing, we were essentially borrowing a portion, usually of outpatient mental health services, other behavioral health services is very common. Those services were never enough. Um, the mental health services weren't um, intensive enough. Um, they didn't go to the people where they were. They tended to be terribly clinic-based. Um, tenancy support services now can ensure that they have a home from which to access other health care services. Um, I work with a lot of other states around the country that are covering the possibilities around Medicaid funding to supported housing services. And I truly can tell you, Washington State is leading the way. Literally was on a call yesterday with the southeastern state who said, oh, we just look longingly with the Washington State benefits, et cetera, um, and really, you know, look forward to the day when we can implement them as well. So know that you're doing this, not just as a local leader and not just for the vulnerable populations that you work with, um, but also for uh, this work across the country. Um, many of us in the field have known for a long time housing is a foundation for health and stability. It's really exciting that the healthcare sector um, has really caught up with that um, and that Washington's um, healthcare authority is embracing these services in a big way to address this significant need. The next slide. So health insurance, that, that messy, messy world that we all have to live in both for ourselves and for the people we serve. I know a lot of supportive housing service providers, especially those of you who might not be using Medicaid for reimbursement, this idea of accessing health insurance payments instead of a grant from philanthropy or contract from the local government, it's a change. Um, and I want to assure you that from my lens and looking at healthcare integration work across the country, it's an absolutely essential change. Um, it's exciting to have the opportunity to take advantage of this. It's exciting that your state is making the investment um, in making this transition, um, not just to make these services support um, uh, services and the rollout um, supportive in the long term, but supportive for the providers as well. The reason it's so critical is that flexible dollars that are currently paying for supportive housing services are needed in other cases. Um, sophisticated budgeters are looking at um, state-funded services, grant-funded dollars that really just bring down a dollar. If we put a dollar in services from the state, that's a dollar. If, but if we are able to put it down in Medicaid, it actually turns into $2 because the federal government puts in that additional dollar. Um, that's how the Medicaid program is structured. Uh, we can serve so many more people when it becomes possible to really go to scale um, and serve everyone who actually needs supportive housing. Um, you can get the more intensive services through the Medicaid program. So just a little bit, as I said about Medicaid, it's paid through an agreement between the state and the federal government. In this case, the 50-50 match. Every dollar your state pays, the Fed matches that. In the case of the expansion Medicaid pool, uh, that's the individuals who weren't eligible for Medicaid probably prior to 2012, 2013 in your state. Uh, for the Medicaid expansion population, the federal government pays a 90-10 match. Um, there's three key aspects of using health insurance to pay for services, and it's important for you to keep in mind as you add Medicaid to your book of business. Um, one, Medicaid can only pay for services that are medically necessary. The great news is that the Washington Healthcare Authority and CMS, that's the federal um, health care authority, have determined that supportive housing services are medically necessary for a specific subset of people. It's why they've agreed to pay for the services through Medicaid. Medicaid cannot pay for housing. They can't pay for rental subsidies. They can't pay for capital costs. That's been made very clear multiple times. Um, every time this conversation comes up with CMS, that's the first thing they start with but um, they can pay for services and they're looking forward for ways to do that. The rate at which FCS supportive services are funding is one of the robust, most robust resources available to fully fund your agency services activities. The funding is not time limited. You'll continue to be reimbursed for delivering services to everyone who is eligible and enrolled in the Medicaid program for as long as they need these services. In this way, we finally begin to address long-term needs with long-term resources rather than just short-term grants and contracts. I'm going to turn it over now to Debbie to get into a few more of the nuts and bolts about how your agency can get started. Debbie. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. McGuire. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with service delivery. Next slide. So when you think about delivering services in supportive housing under the FCS benefit, the good news is that if you are providing supportive housing services today, you are already delivering FCS services because the benefit is designed to capture all those services that we often say in supportive housing, address whatever it takes to get someone housed and to stay housed. 
So you'll see in this checklist here that there are a number of services that you may already be providing, such as housing assessment, housing search, outreach, connection with community services and resources, and assistance with applications and recertification, as well as education, training, and coaching to ensure that you have full access to your rights as a tenant and are able to abide by lease terms. So the services that you're already providing in supportive housing are essentially what is being paid for now under this benefit. And what this gives you an opportunity to do is to access a new revenue source to pay for those core services. If supportive housing is new to you and perhaps you've been a transitional housing provider or delivering community-based services but not directly providing pre-tenancy and tenancy support services, then you'll want to reach out for training and technical assistance to ensure that your team is staffed up and practicing the best practices of supportive housing, such as housing search and placement, housing choice, and evidence-based practices like housing first, motivational interviewing, assertive engagement, and trauma-informed care. And there are many aspects of the ramping up of this benefit that the state is engaged in to ensure that you have those tools and access to training and technical assistance. They have teams all over the state in multiple services areas to ensure that you've got what you need to deliver supportive housing services in a high quality way. CSH also provides guidelines on the dimensions of quality supportive housing, which you can access on our website. Next slide. So in terms of who the benefit serves, this essentially is also well aligned with who we're already serving in supportive housing. And it's important to know that you must be 18 years of age or older in order to receive the FCS supportive housing services benefit. The employment benefit for supported employment is for people 16 and older. So as long as someone is 18 years of age or older, their eligibility for supportive housing services essentially is based on the three key eligibility requirements for supportive housing. The first being income. So we know that nearly everyone who needs supportive housing has an extremely low income. And as long as someone is eligible for Medicaid, they meet that income requirement because they're at less than 138% of the poverty level. So it's important to know that in our state, eligibility for Medicaid is now based solely on income. And you essentially have public paid health insurance if you are at 138% of the poverty level or less. So that's kind of a standard eligibility requirement that's going to be the same across the board for supportive housing and for FCS supportive housing services benefits. The services need is also critical. So a lot of people that need supportive housing have complex health care needs. You can see many of them listed here. These are specifically delineated in the eligibility criteria for the benefit. Another thing that's important to keep in mind because we are talking about health insurance is that services must be medically necessary. Just as Dr. McGuire explained, medical necessity is a core component of ensuring a need for Medicaid services. And finally, the third is housing risk factor. So essentially here, the state has also lined up all the criteria to address not only the people who are already experiencing chronic homelessness, but those who are stuck in institutions or unfortunately cycling between institutions and homelessness who really need supportive housing. So we're addressing the current crisis of chronic homelessness and we're able to go upstream and help to move people into less restrictive and more independent settings in which they can live in their own homes and their own communities. Okay, next slide. So let's talk numbers a little bit. I uh, want to talk with you about the revenue aspects of this because I know this is a question that a lot of folks have. How do we actually draw this down and how much does it pay? Let's look at the next slide. So I would say in, in my experience in working in supportive housing for many years uh, in several states across the country that this is truly one of the most reliable and robust sources of supportive housing services that I've seen available to providers. And that's because it really was based on interviews with supportive housing providers like some of you on the webinar today about what it takes to actually de deliver these services. And it's grounded in that foundation of what a case ratio needs to be 
to serve people with the greatest needs. So the way this breaks down, and I'll get into a little bit more detail of how it works in the next slide, but essentially you are looking at about $6,300 per person per year in terms of services revenue. So if you're serving one eligible client under FCS for supportive housing services, that's going to equate to approximately $6,300 per year. And if you look at a caseload in best practices in supportive housing, we say caseload should be 1 to 10 or 1 to 15. If you look at a caseload of 15 people and multiply that benefit by 15 people, you're talking about a revenue of about $94,500 per year. And it's important to know there on the right of the slide, we talk about the exception to the rule. So there are abilities for providers to seek additional uh, exceptions for additional payments for people who may have greater needs. So this is um, essentially should be enough for you to hire your tenancy support services specialist and for you to have supervision and training for that person and contribute to some degree to your costs of operating the program. I want to talk about this third point just a little bit in terms of what it means that this is a demonstration project. We've gotten quite a few questions about this and when those of us in the supportive housing field hear about a demonstration project or a pilot project, we usually think of something that's short term and sort of based on the hot, bad, new idea that's going on. Let's try something new. And a lot of funders like to fund demonstration projects because they hope that some other funder is going to sort of magically step in with a more sustained source of funding to keep the demonstration program going. But as we know, that's not always so likely to happen um, because we don't have a ton of experience with our ability to move pilots into permanent interventions. So when we have an intervention like supportive housing that we know works and we have an evidence base for, it's really important that we have a sustained source of revenue and services funding so that we have long-term dollars paying for long-term needs. FCS is completely different than our current idea about what a demonstration project might be. When we shifted the conversation around supportive housing services to Medicaid, we shifted the approach to financing these services within the framework of a multi-billion dollar industry. So if you look at most state Medicaid budgets, I think you might be blown away to to see literally the billions of dollars going into healthcare. And the healthcare system doesn't work on the same kind of pilots that we're used to and the types of short-term grant funding that we're used to. The healthcare system is really a machine and it is invested in paying for the best possible health outcomes for the best possible cost. So when the Medicaid expansion happened in Washington, everyone in the healthcare industry started working really hard to figure out how are we going to provide healthcare services to more people while keeping our costs down? And here we were able to make the business case for supportive housing and the evidence base for supportive housing to show that it produces the kinds of outcomes that the health system wanted and reduces costs really spoke for itself. Supportive housing services are clearly an avenue to better healthcare, better access, and lower costs for the most vulnerable people. The accountability in an 1115 waiver, which is the authority through which the state is implementing this benefit, is very high, and the investments on the part of the health system are very significant. So think for a moment about the size of a common demonstration project you're used to. Perhaps it serves 20 people, maybe 100. And in the case of this benefit, the state of Washington and the federal government have determined that this approach is so strategic as a way of transforming healthcare delivery for people with the greatest needs that they're committed to serving 4,000 people across the state. This program has already set in motion a significant investment in infrastructure on behalf of the healthcare authority, the Department of Behavioral Health and Recovery, and Aging and Long-Term Services the Aging and Long-Term Services Administration, and the Mirror Group, which is the third-party administrator of the benefit. These agencies are investing heavily in information technology, data tracking, new policies and procedures to enable this benefit to be enacted for the long term. 
So just as many of you are considering how to add this to your book of business and what that might mean in terms of infrastructure changes, the government at the state level is doing the same. It's also worth noting that the state commitments go beyond just what they're doing to get this benefit off the ground. The Department of Commerce recently issued an RFP for rental subsidies specifically designed to support people receiving SDS benefits. So rental assistance coming out from the state services coming out from the state, major infrastructure changes in several departments at the state level are what it's taking just to get this demonstration project off the ground. After a five-year period, if we are successful in demonstrating what we already know to be true about supportive housing, that it does change health outcomes, improve housing stability, and reduce costs, this will turn into an entitlement so that everyone in the state who is eligible will be able to receive supportive housing services. So let's talk a little bit more about what it's going to take to begin adding this revenue. The benefit is paid on a per diem basis. So I think uh, when, when we start thinking about Medicaid, a lot of folks think about the 15-minute increments uh, and kind of the, the older fee-for-service models that uh, were common in mental health. But this benefit for supportive housing services has been structured differently and then it's paid on a daily basis at $105 per day. So if you imagine um, each participant that you're working with is eligible for up to 30 days of service within a six-month authorization period. So if you were to bill $105 a day times 30 days, you'd be looking at $3,150. And as long as a participant continues to need these services, your agency would be reauthorized to provide those services ongoing. So within a year, you're looking at two authorization periods, which totals the 6,300 that I talked about on a previous slide. Again, if you're looking at a caseload of 15 participants over two authorization periods, you're looking at $94,500 per year. There's more details you can get about what it means to bill for that daily rate, but it really is regardless of the amount of services that an individual might need that day. It's designed to make sure that you are available to that person and providing the kind of foundational supports they need to get housed and stay housed. Next slide. So you might be thinking about, how am I going to start building a caseload, and how does this work if I have a building coming online? Well, keep in mind that you can build your caseload with a mix of people who will move into single site, integrated, and scattered site supportive housing. So you may have only a couple of units turning over in a building where you're delivering supportive housing, but you might also be running a scattered site model where you can house people in the community. And you can build your caseload on the, out of any combination of housing resources for your participants. To ensure that you'll collect revenue for everyone in a new building, so let's say you've been going through the development process and you're about to lease up a new supportive housing apartment complex, and you want to make sure that you can count on your revenue on the services side for everybody you're going to house. What you would do is make sure that your eligibility criteria for the housing is the same as the eligibility criteria for the FCS services. And as long as those two align, essentially you're going to collect revenue on everybody who's in the building at, at this robust level for the services side. Uh, this should be relatively straightforward and easy to do because the benefit eligibility, as we discussed, is so well aligned with the needs for supportive housing. The other question we get a fair bit is that there are both services for people who are looking for housing and for people who are already housed. So what if one provider is helping someone look for housing and another provider is actually delivering the services in the supportive housing that the person moves into? And the good news is that as long as both of those providers are contracted to deliver FTS services, then they can both collect reimbursement for the portion of services that they deliver. Another thing to keep in mind is that once you collect the revenue, this is essentially revenue to your agency. So there's not a lot of restrictions around how you use it. We talked about caseload size and what that means in terms of about $100,000 of revenue into your agency. It's assumed you're using that to keep your staff capacity up and to make sure that you can deliver these services well and meet the best outcomes possible. And it's really at your discretion and how to do that within your own agency's budgeting. 
Next slide. So let's say you're opening a new building that's going to be 100% supportive housing, and you're wondering how much you can bank on in terms of services revenue from FCS. Well, as I said, if you align your eligibility criteria with the benefit, you can essentially assure that 100% of your tenants are receiving the benefit. But let's say that you know you'll serve a few people who are not documented for U.S. citizenship or they're currently seeking documentation and they're not eligible for, bene uh, for benefits under Medicaid. In that case, you'd want to subtract out that number of people and only multiply the annual benefit by the number of people in the building who are Medicaid eligible essentially everyone else who is below 138% of the poverty level. So in this example, you can see perhaps you're opening a building of 42 units and you believe that 40 people will be eligible for the supportive housing benefit because you intend to serve some people who do not have the U.S. documentation status that they need for Medicaid. In that case, you would multiply the benefit only by the number of people who will be eligible to get to your total annual services revenue. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. McGuire to talk a bit about what an agency might do to meet some of the provider qualifications and requirements to administer the benefit. Great. Thanks, Desi. Um, so here we're talking about provider requirements. So next slide. Uh, this is a great picture of the Amerigroup su Supplemental Provider Manual. This is basically Amerigroup teaching you as the provider how to do the benefit. Um, was reading this literally cover to cover in preparation for this. This is the most user-friendly, not Medicaid wonky, clear and welcoming provider manual, I must say, that I've ever seen. And I've read many of them. I've written many of them. And this is exactly the way they should be written to engage the provider community. Um, Amerigroup is contracted by by the state, their health insurance company, the contract is by the state to manage this contract with the providers of the benefits. So you won't be being paid by the state for these services, will be paid um, by Amerigroup. If you're interested in becoming a contracted provider, um, you should talk with Amerigroup directly. Um, I want to emphasize that Amerigroup is very so much accepting new providers. There's a considerable amount of technical assistance and support that's available to providers who are new to this um, from both America Group and the state. Um, please know that if your um, agency offers uh, supportive employment services as well that's also covered in this provider manual. Um, we're not going to go over all the details of the provider manual. I really recommend that folks who are seriously considering this read this, but I want to highlight a couple of the elements to get you thinking about the differences and practices and the way you do business in order to access this funding. There's a lot that's going to be the same. There's a couple of things to really highlight that might be a little different. So next slide. Um, um, Amerigroup in the state really want to bring in providers that have um, strong experience in supportive housing. So requirements to become an FCS provider, one of them is going to be um, two years of experience in supportive housing services. So this is if you your agency has two years of experience in coordination of supportive housing or independent living services, you can be eligible for the benefit. Um, look at some of these others. I won't read them all to you, but you should know it's accessible to anyone who has a track record of delivering quality supportive housing services and who's committed to ongoing quality monitoring and data tracking. Um, the piece I want to highlight here is your agency's capacity. Um, your agency will need to be able to ensure ex um, adequate administrator controls. Um, I know Debbie talked about that 94, 5,000. Um, included in there, I would imagine, is some time um, for an administrative coordinator, sometime possibly for a billing coordinator, sometime for a quality assurance individual. Um, and, and also would recommend that you look at hiring people who have Medicaid um, experience in there. Um, the piece I want to highlight again is the capacity of your agency will need to ensure these adequate administrative controls with these key staff, staffing positions. We want to ensure that you're tracking your work in a way that provides a mayor group in the state with the information they need to see the outcome of the benefit. Um, so you'll need to consider the administrative staffing capacities here to attract, um, to attract outcomes and submit claims. I know submit claims is one of those big, broad phrases, but it's really something that a mayor group is happy to walk you through with. Um, let's take a closer look at some of these elements of that claim on the next slide. So here's what Amerigroup's going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for a monthly report on the form that they provide within 15 days at the end of each month detailing the enrollees served. They're going to be looking for quarterly progress reports, which include demographic and services information, um, looking at performance outcomes, quality improvement activities, as specified by the FCS program. Again, all of this, the forms, et cetera, is all in the Amerigroup Provider Manual. 
Providers are encouraged to submit claims electronically, but Amerigroup will work with providers based on their technology capacity. And that's something that we highly recommend over time that folks build that capacity internally. So next slide, please. All right, providers will participate with and provide data to Amerigroup for the program monitoring work. Um, they're going to be looking for something, uh, a couple of data elements here. They're going to be looking for what are called eligibility determinations. This is documentation that says that on the day that your agency that's qualified to provide the service, the person you provided the service to was Medicaid enrolled. I wanna make an important distinction between Medicaid eligibility. Um, that means that I have the low income that's required for Medicaid eligibility, but it's important that the state knows who people are and that they are enrolled in the program. Service utilization, work on what you did with the individuals. They're going to be looking for grievances and appeals. This one is a real change um, in sometimes for supportive housing providers. There's federally directed details about how if someone says, I didn't receive the service, I'm not happy with my services, there's some detailed processes there. Um, they'll want information on client incidents and then an outcome measure such as stays in housing. There, the state is really trying to prove overall that housing makes the difference in healthcare. Um, housing is a platform for health. Um, you're gonna uh, appreciate all the efforts everyone's been doing to submit that information. They can roll that up and show those outcomes. Um, claim submissions will be submitted electronically, specifying a particular billing code, H0043. Um, your agency is going to need uh, the IT systems to track these kind of outcomes and report them to Amerigroup. Many of the data elements will be items you're already tracking um, or elements of your own, of your agency's own continuous quality improvement. It's important that you dedicate staff time and budgeting to do this. It'll be very helpful as the budget, well, I'm sorry, not budget, as the benefit rolls out and as you're rolling this up that you have um, some experienced Medicaid billing folks on your staff who can pull this information together and get that to Amerigroup. Um, to keep this as easy as possible, that's certainly been the state's commitment. They're only using one administrative code when submitting claims, that H0043. It'll help to keep that side of administration relatively simple. Um, the fact that the state has done a third party administrator, so that you're only working with Amerigroup, not with multiple MCOs, I think that helps as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Debbie now to wrap it up with some additional resources here. Okay, great. So uh, we are going to move into your questions, and uh, we have folks from the state standing by to assist in answering questions, as well as those of us on the panel. And so I encourage you to submit those in the chat box so the facilitators can keep track of them, and we can sift through them and, and get to all of them. And just wanted to briefly, before we uh, offer a list of resources, give you a little update on where things are in terms of getting both benefits under foundational community supports off the ground. We're at a really exciting time right now where total enrollment is approaching 1,900 people. Uh, and we've got a number of people that are enrolled in both services. So I do encourage you, we talked a lot on this webinar about supportive housing services, but keep in mind that supported employment services are an incredible complement to the services you're delivering in supportive housing and could be another way for your agency to expand your capacity and serve people that you're housing well. So a lot of people are getting enrolled. 85 providers are already contracted with Amerigroup across the state. So there's definitely room for many, many more providers and we want to make sure that during this initial period when there's a lot of additional technical assistance and training support from the mayor group and the state and their TA providers that providers can get in and get those contracts up and running. So please don't hesitate to reach out directly to Amerigroup to start that conversation. Their email is at the top of the slide and you can literally say, hey, I went to this webinar and I wanna know more about this. And you don't have to have anything else figured out. They'll help you walk through the process. So Brooke, I think we've got a few resources to share with folks and then we'll move into Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Debbie and, and Marcella. This is just phenomenal information. These links here are resources for you all to access and you will have direct hyperlinks to this once you are able to download this presentation. And each link will take you to one of these topics. So for instance, the training and event center calendar, which gives you a robust 
um, list of events and upcoming trainings around the foundational community supports, Amer groups resources around their provider information and consumer guides, as well as the healthcare authorities foundational community supports informational link and, and up to date information as to what's happening around foundational community supports. And we encourage you and all of your, your partners in this work to please register and sign up for the foundational community supports newsletter. This is where you're going to get instant information on a, a monthly basis as to what's happening and getting kept up to speed so you are aware of the, new, the, the latest and the greatest information around foundational community support. So without further ado, we want to hear from you. We've done a lot of talking and provided you all with some game changer information that we hope this is going to be a, a game changer for you in your, in your book of business. But what are some questions that you all have? And I will turn it over to Tisha and Kate in order to help us facilitate the questions. Hi, this is Tisha. We've got um, a question that's come through the chat. In particular, it's wondering about, you would mentioned about the potential revenue in the year of up to $94,000. They're wondering, once they've used some of that on salary, how else they can use that within their agency? What else can they spend that money on? Also, an agency <laughs> revenue, that's up to the agency, um, et cetera. So the expectation is commonly what I've seen when agencies are doing this, they're spending it, obviously they're covering the staff that are generating the revenue, um, but they're also covering their administrative costs. I um, talked about um, quality assurance support, um, billing coordination support, and then information technology support um, as they need it in order to generate the information. Debbie, anything else? What else do you think? I think the only thing I can think of in addition to that is uh, staff training and uh, any any resources that they might need to do their jobs well. The next, this is Tisha, the next question is, can you tell us a bit about using SBS funds to offset funding? Uh, this is Debbie. I'll take a stab at that to offset funding. So um, I'm guessing the question is about if you're if you're already receiving some other kind of revenue to pay for your supportive housing services. And I would say uh, it is important that you delineate how your revenue sources are used. Uh, no funder likes to double up uh, with another, so you want to make sure that. Um, your FCS benefits are um, not supplanting any existing funds that are already designed to do that. But certainly you can pair these funds to serve a person well. So if you've got FCS benefits paying for supportive housing services and supported employment services and you need a grant from your local municipality to provide a child uh, specialist, a clinical specialist for children because you're serving families in supportive housing, or uh, additional supports around mental health or peer support, you can certainly pair up and, and leverage the resources that you need for a complete funding package. I'd also say that it's important for funders, if there's any funders on, on the phone, on the webinar, to consider that those flexible dollars that providers might currently be using to pay for supportive housing services, if a, if a provider uh, signs up for FCS and starts to bring in this additional revenue source, it's really critical to be strategic about how those existing resources are used because the idea here is that we're going to scale, right? This should be a resource that definitely moves us exponentially into the future in terms of the amount of revenue that we have for homeless services and services that keep people out of institutions. So it's important to be strategic about how we're leveraging this new resource with all the existing resources so that we continue to focus the dollars on the people who need them the most. This is awesome. So one piece I would add is that as, as I've seen agencies go through this transition, commonly what they do is they designate initially certain staff 
this is the staff, these are the staff who are focused on billing and revenue and additional staff maybe have some of those expectations, but not the same. As the agency gets through the transition, the, the percentage of staff that are focused on billing, that, that are billing for their service, I want to say focus, they're focused on serving, but that are billing for their services, um, that, that transitions over time. Um, and that may depend on whether you've got a new building coming up. And so all of the staff that are supporting there are from part of the FBS benefit. Maybe you've got one or two new people coming in in a scattered site or a single site program, um, and, and you manage that accordingly. But um, staff who are billing do usually have billing expectations. They need to be sure that they're seeing, um, you know, people at least 30 days for those encounters in that six month period, et cetera. Um, so the management of those of staff that are billing may be a little bit different and you want to build in a transition period for that. This is Kate with the Healthcare Authority. Just to add to that, if you visit the Healthcare Authority's foundational community support webpage, which is linked on the last slide that Brooke reviewed, we have written guidance on how um, how to coordinate and grade FCS service resources with other types of services. So that uh, document's called FCS resource the planting guidance and if you have any specific questions or need more clarification the healthcare authority can help you understand those rules this is Tisha we've got three or two or three more questions I'm going to read the next one if that's all right do young people age 18 through 26 who are foster care alumni and have Medicaid through age 26 um, through coordinated care qualify. So their foster care, so people have been in foster care, um, they've aged out, they have got Medicaid up to age 26, would they qualify for this benefit? Tisha, this is Debbie. If uh, one of you at the state can take this one, I want to make sure we get some specifics correct. Yeah, Kate? Sure. Uh, they potentially could be. They would need to meet one of the health needs. So there's just one of the several options and one of the housing risk factors that was outlined earlier. So if they uh, are, it sounds like the, in this situation, they're receiving um, their Medicaid coverage through coordinated care, they're 18 or older. So those are two eligibility requirements. And then they would also need to meet, have a health need and a risk criteria. Thank you, Kate. The next question is, could you stop using grant funding you currently have for supportive service, move that to rental assistance, and then let foundational community supports be used for supportive services? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm jumping up and down with joy for that question. That, that, that's a brilliant way of looking at this and, and really expanding the pool of who we can serve. Absolutely. Wonderful. So then I'm just going to repeat it one more time. So it's perfectly fine to stop using your grant funding that you currently have for supportive services, move that to rental assistance, and then let Foundation of Community Supports be used for supportive services. And that resource, the planting guide, provides direction on how to do that within existing Medicaid rules. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is about recertification for individuals who stabilize. Um, there's a fear that that, the, that once someone becomes stabilized, um, people won't be as vulnerable and then they won't qualify for the services anymore. They stop getting the services and then they, then they would be stabilized. Okay, um, I think I understand that risk. Um, so two, two parts to that. Uh, one is if someone no longer needs the services, wonderful. You know, we, we've all done our job to help somebody regain stability and autonomy. Uh, so, so certainly as with any other services funding, if, if it's not needed, uh, it, it's not paying for those services. But if someone, uh, you know, gets to a point where they are no longer needing these services and then sometime later, whether it's a few weeks or a few years, uh, 
has a situation in which they need these services again, they would be eligible for these services. And that's really part of the beauty of, of this being a, a person-specific benefit is in that it, uh, it is available to people so long as they need it. Kate, can you jump in and talk a little bit about the but for? Yes. Uh, so a common question we, we get is, okay, so somebody, for example, the risk criterion that allowed them to be eligible to receive services maybe was that they were experiencing chronic homelessness. After six months of services, now they're stably housed. Does that mean at the reauthorization point, because they're no longer chronically homeless, they lose eligibility? And the answer is we are absolutely not penalizing people or providers for success. That's what we want to see and we know that um, for the, the, the populations where we're prioritizing for these services, but for the provision of ongoing tenancy sustaining services, a lot of folks would be at high risk of experiencing homelessness again. So as long as somebody continues to need services in order to maintain either their job through supported employment services or their housing or through the supportive housing benefit, they can um, have that, um, that, that service reauthorized for foundational community support. So people are, again, are not penalized for success as long as, but for the services, they'd be at risk of losing their housing or employment. And then one last question. Do you have resources for mitigating criminal backgrounds and prior evictions? Um, so it sounds like this question is asking about resources to help maybe ac somebody access um, a, a private market um, um, uh, rental unit. Uh, we can maybe provide a link to some legal services so people can learn more about what legal protections are out there for tenants and what resources are available to, to help make sure people have access to housing. Um, foundational community support can serve folks. Absolutely, we want to prioritize folks with those backgrounds, and we can help you find uh, more resources about addressing specific housing barriers. Mm -hmm. And then, on a, just, then there was also, the, oh, go on. I'm just going to just restate, I guess, and clarify that um, criminal background is, is not a condition of Medicaid eligibility. Correct. Um, and then one last, one last chat was just asking if we could use these resources to clone Kate Baber because she's so wonderful. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right. Well, we want to say thank you so much for everyone that took the time to participate on this webinar today. We hope that it met your need and really gave you a great overview of how you can use foundational community support to embed in your existing business practices and utilize it to serve uh, our most vulnerable populations. Um, so we will be sending out the resources, the recording for today, as well as this PowerPoint presentation. And we look forward to talking with you all on November 1st and on our next topic around Los Angeles. So thank you all very much. Thank you to the state um, for hosting today. And thank you to Dr. McGuire and Ms. Debbie for your presentation as well. Thank you very much.